it's huge. It is huge, yeah. I pulled it out and looked at it, and I was very uninspired by it. Hello, and welcome back. Thanks for joining us for another episode. I am Malcolm Childs. And I'm James Giffins, and we're just making conversation. Where we discuss the ins and outs of the model-making hobby that brings us joy and pain in equal measure. From the greasy sprues to the gloss coats and everything in between, we are going to be just making conversation. Remember, there are other... (coughs) Sorry. Remember, there are other podcasts you can listen to. Better podcasts. Plastic Model Mojo. (laughs) The Scale Model Podcast. The Plastic Posse Podcast. On the Bench. Model Geeks. The Sprue Cutters Union. Small Subjects. And not forgetting Build Sideways. Head to modelpodcast.com for all the links. If you have enjoyed our podcast, consider leaving a review or five stars. Showing your support to us is as easy as making a coffee. In fact, why not go over to buymeacoffee.com forward slash JMC podcast and do just that. Your support will help go towards making the podcast just a little bit better. In this episode, we'll just be making conversation about modelling stashes. The purchases for future builds, impulse buys, or just because you can. Let's face it, those shiny new kits are a must-have because you've been waiting forever for that subject. Or is it because at that price, you just can't help yourself? Why do we feel the need to buy more kits than we will ever build in our lifetime? What will retirement look like with all the plastic to build? Or do you worry when that dreaded retirement looms you will have not enough money to buy kits? When is it time to stop buying them? Hey, James. Hey, buddy, you all right? Yeah, I'm good. What are you up to? Ah, oh, relaxing with a cup of coffee. Nice. Have you got uh, time for a chat? Oh, yeah, let's do it. Have you got about an hour-ish? So let's kick off with any feedback and comments we've had. Yay. Okay. Yes, we've had some some positive stuff. We don't read the negatives. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, we'd be here all night. <laughs> what uh, what comments did we have? Uh, we've had Costa um, mm. buy me a coffee, bought some coffee. Thank you very much. I'm slurping as we talk. Uh, and he says, just finished listening to the Can of Worms episode. Thank you for discussing this. Yes, it was Costa's idea. So many truths spoken during the 60 minutes. Here's a much-deserved cup of coffee to go with your worms. Thank you for that. Oh, wow. Oh, well, he's going to send us money for reading out his own ideas. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Keep them coming. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you, Costa. That's great. Other one from Tim. This is uh, Tim and his cat, Sunkissed. He says, from worms yes. to walnuts, we both like your latest podcast. Thank you very much, Tim. It's very nice. It's very kind. One other comment we've had was from Ryan, actually on the Walnut Challenge group build page. And he said, the guys talked about my nuts in this episode. It's nice to know that one's nuts are on the lips of others. (laughs) 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 I do that so hard to... um, It's not hard. (laughs) Give it a listen. (laughs) Give it a listen and get your own nuts. It's an addictively simple challenge to build a diorama in a walnut shell. Well, thank you, Ryan. That is such a segue straight into the Walnut Challenge group build, strangely. We got the the jingle, haven't we, to play? We have. Yeah, so let's just play that. What's your update on your walnuts? How far have you got? Where have you got? What's happening? What's going on? Uh, well, Walnut uh, challenge! Uh, yes, uh, my nuts are uh, half shelled. Um, I've bought some um, some bits to go in my Dremel because I'm going to try and cut my nuts in a, a way in which I can uh, keep the nut itself together but create some steps into the nut. Uh, and I'm going to leave it at that and make you all wonder what that on earth I'm talking about. And the, the nuts that I've halved, I have got to still muck around with and clean out and uh, start applying myself 
Mm. Yes. So, yeah, not a lot of progress from me, unfortunately, but there will be in the, the coming weeks, definitely. You need to pay more attention to your, your nut work, basically. Yeah, so I've neglected my nuts. Um, yeah, they're quite sad and, and yeah, wrinkly. So, yeah, looking at this uh, looking at this group builder, this Facebook's gone crazy and mad, exploded all over the place. Um, there's, uh, there's some fantastic stuff on there. Um, I don't know if you want to talk about anything that's particularly leapt out of you recently. Um, I know I'm not going to actually because we, we we're going to cover that in the next episode. Um, but yeah, you're right. There is some amazing and inspiring actually builds. Uh, you know, things that uh, this sounds really silly and simple, but you know, Peter Brown, for example, that has just managed to 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 get his nuts. Um, and display them on what I can only describe as like an egg tray, uh, of which there are <laughs> there are eleven nuts. There's one hole missing, which I'm not sure if that means he's lost one or <laughs> he was fiddling with one. I don't. But he says they're a decent size, so that's cool. Yeah. Um, you know, just just that in itself, and the the <laughs> the, the sheer amount of people that are getting involved is um, it's just phenomenal. Yes. Go and have a look. It's the uh, Walnut Challenge group build on Facebook. Anyone can join. I do have to say, though, our fellow podcasters, um, now some of them are members of the group build, but I've not seen any work towards making any. So I know the Nats are coming up, and I know they're all gathering. Um, we've been left out purely by by our own circumstances. So we won't be with them, unfortunately. But please, I implore you, uh, I know you listen to our podcast as much as we listen to yours. So give it a go. If I have to accept a challenge from you guys in return, then I'm more than happy to do so. <laughs> Get your nuts out. Give them, give them a whirl. What's the model show they're all meeting at called? At the Nats. And the Nats. Not, not. <laughs> well, uh, with my spelling, yes, it would be Nats. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone can get involved at all. It's a bit of fun. I'm hoping, I mean, this has been running now for, we're actually the second month. It actually started on the 1st of May. Oh, there you go. That's, I didn't think it was that far. So 1st of May it started. Uh, we set up the page early to give you plenty of warning. And and it, the end date is the 1st of August. So um, Malcolm's got some lovely rules um, that he's written. Uh, just pay attention to um, the first couple of lines. Uh, we want you to fall outside the rules. It's all for fun anyway, so it doesn't really matter. No, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at all that people break the rules. It makes no difference whatsoever. Uh, they're still valid and handsome people. It's all fine. <laughs> if you join the page or you're a member of the group, you'll understand why Malcolm's making that statement. I'm not going to say it. <laughs> We're coming to the end of this part of the, the podcast. So what I really like is the fact that someone has gone out of the way and bought some nuts and are making more than one build. Yes, you do need a couple spare, just in case you uh, can't break the shell properly, but um, yeah. a lot of people are doing more than one entry, um, and it seems that once you've done one, you want to do more. So it might be hard work, guys. It's uh, It really is truly inspiring. So, yeah, thank you. There we go. There's your nut. Yes. Your nut update. Nut update. You are now up to date. Updates and nuts. Oh, if you can involve uh, dates in your nuts, good for you. <laughs> anyway, we're going to talk about stashes today. We are. And that's kind of down that down to the new feature that we're going to be running, isn't it? Stash or cash or... or... What are we going to call it? What I'm going to do is I'm actually going to put a poll up on the Facebook group asking you what you want to call this section. Uh, the premise of the section is basically we're going to select a couple of kits that's in our stash and we're going to talk about the kits uh, and then we're going to decide whether we should put them back in the stash for posterity for our retirement or whatever or we're going to cash them in or maybe swap them out to something else something along those lines <laughs> and what we're asking you guys to do is to um, write us in a message and tell us about some, some kits in which are in your stash that you don't know whether they hold on to or whether to find new owners for. 
Yeah, so we'll we'll discuss it openly, and we'll we'll discuss what we would do ourselves if we had that kit and that dilemma. Maybe we can't find a a solution for you. You don't have to do what we say. Just <laughs> no, no, that's right. It's just a, just an opinion. We'll open it up to the people on the Facebook page as well. Yeah, when we do a podcast where we've discussed certain kits, we'll put that up, and maybe we could do a poll to see what the the majority of our listeners would do as well. Yeah, maybe. So, uh, a little bit of a little bit of way of interacting, and of course, you may have heard this in another podcast. But I can assure you, we've not stolen the idea. We have the, the, taken the idea on board with permission, and uh, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna see how it goes. Do we adopt the idea? Maybe that's a good way of saying it. I think that's exactly what we do. We're adopting the idea. It was it was a segment in the Scale Model Shed, Graham, Ivan, and Dan. Mm-hmm. great podcast and that was one of the things in which they did and the listeners seemed to engage and enjoy it so talking to the three of them it's something in which sort of keen to see come back maybe we'll see <laughs> i'll give it a go a lot of people have said to me in person they said oh it'd be good if you did stash stash or cash that scar model shed i think a lot of people enjoyed it so we will try and put our own spin on it and bring some entertainment that way also give us a bit of content for us yeah, absolutely. The topic is stashes. So uh, I'm assuming you've got a stash, have you? Yes, I do. Goes with your beard? <laughs> That's a moustache. Oh, sorry. That bit is a moustache. <laughs> behind me, as I think you can see if I move my webcam, uh-huh. behind me is uh, my overflow, let's say. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. And in the garage is where most of my model kits are, are, are based. <laughs> the garage, not the best place um, because the the boxes get squished and everything else. But uh, kits inside are fine. I reckon I have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. I'm probably about a bit more in there. I probably have about thirty model kits. I'd say in my stash, um, and probably about. Oof, about five different types of figures, I would imagine. Uh, on on the because there's another little shelf uh, a bit lower down. Can you see that one? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. Um, and that's got like accessory sets and um, uh, there's a jet bike from Elan Thirteen in there. Yeah. There's my uh, bolt action stuff as well. So that won't be part of my stash. I guess my books as well. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've been collecting part of my stash. Um, I don't know. But, yeah, I would say 30 kits or so, which is fine for me. I never ever wanted them to be lots of kits there. I don't, I don't, I'm not much of a collector. Mm. Uh, I said that, you know, 10 years ago or whatever I was. <laughs> when I started the kit. Started the, uh, the stupid hobby that we do. Oh, I'm never going to ever have and more kits than I can build. Mm. I'm never, ever going to start another kit when I've still got one half done. I'm never going to have a, a shelf of doom. I'm never. I, I'm way beyond that. I'm never going to ever get to that situation. Uh, it didn't take a couple of years before I got to that situation. <laughs> got lax and ended up f- falling for things um, and got lots of ideas. That's the that's the problem. Got lots of ideas. I'm, I'm sure other models have the same. Well, lots and lots of ideas. Not enough time. Um, but yeah, I have a couple of kits in the stash that I. Um, umming and ahhing about uh, yeah. whether to keep them or not. So those will be in my uh, stash or cash um, bit later on. We'll yeah. talk about those those three. Uh, what about you? What's your describe your mustache to me? I, I, I'm the same. In that, uh, yeah, I would definitely class books as or reference material as part of the stash uh, because it's all related. Um, in my little hobby room that I have, I have somewhere in the region of 40 to 50 kits, I think. Um, that's a very, very quick, uh, while you were talking, look around and go, oh my God, really? Is that that many? Um, <laughs> I've got um, four, five, in fact, plastic boxes, which are full of extras, diorama stuff and all that sort of goodness and like i've said many times before i'm very fortunate i've got a it's a it's a fairly small room it's quite amazing what you can cram into a small space so yeah i've got quite a lot and um in the loft uh, is where i store mine which again isn't the best place as such um, but we'll talk about places in a little bit i would suggest that i may have as many 
there's maybe a hundred upstairs. Wow. Um, but I've not counted them, uh, and I would probably shiver if I did. But I know for a fact there are some kits up there that um, I have bought on a whim, hmm. uh, of which couple I'm going to talk about today. I have promised myself that I am actually going to try at some point and be hard and um, go up there and literally label everything that I really, 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 really want to keep and everything else has got to go. Mm-hmm. Um, I When I first started with this hobby room in the space to do it, I, I bought stashes from people and mm. and they weren't um they weren't necessarily the things i wanted let's put it that way so have you kept them i've kept them i've kept some of them i did dispose of some stuff i have got a reasonable amount of uh, 172 nd stuff that I'm, I'm not going to build i know i'm not going to build although i should do really because it will take up less room <laughs> sell them off yeah they, they need to go that i have got most models that i want i've got a couple of duplicates not many but i have got a couple mm-hmm. i certainly haven't got 16 phantoms or anything like that what how do you end up with duplicates because when you go to a model show um and you start seeing the honey um you want some don't you so i, I i've picked up a couple here and there that are that are duplicates so are they accidental purchases then well, no, I, I purposely meant to buy them, but I purposely didn't remember whether I got them or not. So they're kind of like double more important because you already had it, but you forgot you had it and yeah. you still wanted it. So, yeah. This is the problem. And this is one of the things in which we should, there are different ways in which you can do this, which we'll cover in a second. But what you should really do is, is make a list of what you've got and keep it in a, in a format in which you can refer to in those moments where you're sat in the honey pot, looking at all the lovely kits, thinking, I really want that. Well, that's what Scalemates is for. There we go. Scalemates is a brilliant, brilliant way of keeping track of your stash. Yep. In, funny enough, the stash that section. <laughs> um, <laughs> of which, the, one of the reasons I brought this up was because, hey, it's a really great thing to do. Because you can have it on, you can, you can immediately look on your phone while you're standing there and quickly scan through to see whether you really do need that that kit you're looking at mm-hmm. precursors to that i will warn you that the last model show i was at i had the opportunity to walk around when no one else was around and saw three kits that i liked one of which i i really wanted to get which would have been a duplicate i've already built the kit um but it was such a brilliant kit i loved it mm. and that was the 148th dauntless from accurate miniatures i think it was uh-huh. and it was such a lovely kit i loved i really really enjoyed doing it the stall was literally opposite from where I was. Uh, and I sat there and I was I'm in an R in and I'm in an R in and I eventually said to Steph, Oh, I don't know what to do. I really want to get it, but I'm not sure I should. But S- Steph is the friend you were with, yeah. Sorry, yes, Steph, uh Steph Knightley. Yeah, we were we were at a show together. Um he's listening, you come nuts. That's not his name. <laughs> I know, I did it on purpose. We'll find out if he listens. <laughs> Yeah, let's. Uh, yeah, and and I am denied for s- so long that eventually, when I went to go and buy it, uh, I walked past the store and thought, "I'll just go and um, powder my nose." And when I came back, there was a gentleman standing there buying the kit. Yeah, so I lost out. But so, is this a kit that you already had? It's a kit I built. Cool. Well, that's not doubling up. That's fine. I had convinced myself the best thing to do was to buy the kit yeah. and then build them. So that meant I had four, which means I could do a diorama of a carrier top with four Dauntlesses sat on it. That's awesome. And um, that would have been awesome, but uh, unfortunately that didn't happen. Anyway, we di- digress. <laughs> so, yeah, we were talking about doubling up. So uh, maybe I don't have enough kits, but I can't see myself ever buying a kit going, oh, that's a really good one. Oh, wow, I've already got it. For me, they're quite expensive things. But buying it because you forgot you had it, I can't imagine myself doing that. <laughs> it does happen. It does happen. Um, and Scalemates has stopped me from doing that a couple of times. Mm. Um, when I've seen something that I really... I like the subject and thought, oh, yeah, I really would like to get that. <laughs> You've got it. <laughs> the, the, the only the only time that I have actually bought on purpose duplicates uh-huh. was the oh, B B seventeen and the the Lancaster in one forty eighth. Yeah, I have two two of each of those, right. and they're by different manufacturers. And I did it on purpose because I wanted to do a comparison video of an old, for example, the B-17, an old monogram mm-hmm. uh, kit and the new Hong Kong models kit. Yeah. Okay. Uh, 
I really enjoyed doing that. That was quite something I enjoyed doing. So yeah, okay. other than that. That makes sense. I've got two 148 Red Arrows kits, Italiary ones. Italiary. 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 Uh, 148 Red Arrows Special Editions. And there, so there's a reason I have two. Um, not because I forgot. <laughs> uh, because I want to do a diorama one day that involves opening up all the panels that I can on top of a, a Red Arrow Hawk. So to do that, I need two kits. One to cut the um, one to cut the panel out to have the panel, and then one to actually have the the hole, so I can have uh, extra bits and pieces hanging around inside this diorama. It's going to be a hanger diorama. Gotcha. So if I wanted to have an extra rudder mm-hmm. sitting next to the one that's on the aircraft, then I need to have two kits. Yes. So that's why I've got two. And I only remembered that I've got that because I went out to the to the to the garage to have a look at the statues mm-hmm. um, for this show. <laughs> and then I went, oh, yeah, I have the red arrows. And also I have a 132nd um, hawk as well out there Ooh. because I was going to do the diorama in 132nd. Um, but I found that there are better and more uh, accessories in 148 for what I want. Yeah, yeah. So that's why I'm going to stick with 148. Plus it's going to take up less space. One of the things... I would find interesting to talk to you about today, about stashes, was while I was out there, I was thinking, oh, I didn't buy that. That was bought for me mm-hmm. by somebody who want, wanted me to build that. I can't get rid of that. Then. You know, so it's got to stay there. Mm-hmm. Um, and, I, and I thought to myself, how acceptable is it to sell a kit that was purchased for you when you aren't going to have the mojo to build it? Do, do you think it's okay to do? What do you think? The short answer is yes. Okay. Um, because that, that model's been bought for you. you. know it will bring you joy, happiness. If it's a subject matter in which is not going to float your boat or, or give you that feeling that you we all crave when we make models, I think most people that would have bought you the gift would be understanding. Okay. And this is where, in a way, that the swap idea is a really cool idea because you could – swap it with something that you want so you're it's not a cash incentive it's a case of i've got this kit i'm giving it to this person because they really love the subject i don't but i'm taking this off him because i really love that subject and they don't okay so you're kind of keeping the spirit of the gift alive yes it's just not the actual physical plastic yeah i think the only only problem comes where you you sell a kit and then go off and buy yourself um, something completely different yeah yeah you go and treat yourself to a holiday somewhere or uh, what, <laughs> it's a hell of a kit <laughs> well yeah <laughs> it's a win that wins kit it, yeah no i don't I, I don't personally have an issue with that i mean even to the point where i've got kits which i've bought from people and they've sold it to me cheap yeah and at the time, I bought them and gone, oh, yeah, I really want to do that. And now I look at them and go, I don't know why that enthused me at the time. And it's not something I want to build now. So in that case, I've actually contacted the people I bought them from and said, look, I've had a, I've had a thought about it. I've got this kit. Um, it's in the stash. But I really don't think I'm going to build it are you okay a for me to sell it and b if i make more money than what i purchased it for would you like to split the difference huh right You're very honest of you uh in each occasion the people have said no i sold that to you for what i thought was a fair price at the time that's fine do what you want with it right yeah, yeah okay and i think that's mainly down to the fact that i've been i open about it and said look you know i feel a little bit guilty yeah yeah uh, we mentioned at the beginning didn't we that the kits kind of keep their value as we also said at the beginning, that kits can go up in value um, as well. Once you keep it nice, don't start the kit. If you start that kit, you've d- destroyed the resale value of that kit. <laughs> Just don't glue the stuff. Uh, it's not too no. bad taking it off the sprue, as long as you do it well. Um, but yeah, just don't put any glue or paint on it and try and sell it off as a, as a kit. Yeah, Bad idea. Bad idea. But yeah, Definitely. it's like gold. You know, the price of gold goes up and down. Uh, you can invest in plastic. And we've got a good example of that with Wing Nut Wings. You know, the kit sold for um, a good amount of money. And obviously, as soon as it was announced they were no longer, there was a flood of Wing Nut Wing kits uh, uh, being sold at incredible money. It still is. It, it's, that's not often happens, in fairness. No. But um, no. I suppose it's on the choices of which you make. I remember when the Bandai Attack came out first, 
when it first came out. And I wanted it because I want to build a, a diorama of uh, Ray's uh, house. And mm. it came out and it was £85. And I just could not, could not for the life of me warrant spending that much money on what is essentially reasonably small kit because it's only 144 yeah. scale. Um, so I said, no, I'm not going to buy it. I, I'm going to wait until the price came down. And the price well, it came down to 50 you know, about mm-hmm. a month later after it came out. And then it went down a little bit more. And I saw it at a model show six months later uh, for 45 And I thought, I'm going to buy it now. So, because cause 45 I can, I, I, I can ha- I'm happy with that. So, yeah, I bought it for 45 quid, and that's, and that's pretty much where the price has stayed around there. I've seen it 42, I've seen it, I got up to 48. Yeah, just slightly more than half of the price it came out as. I was going to say, if you if your kit comes out and you want, just wait six months, maybe even less, and that value of that kit will drop. You know, the new releases come out, and you're like, oh, oh, oh I can't have that. That's, that's, that's amazing. Yeah. Bar... Wing Nut Wings. I can't think of many other kits that have uh, have have haven't had that scenario. Yeah, yeah. But then you're not you're not buying it to invest, are we? We're not we're not collecting them. Well, I'm not certainly. I'm buying them because I want to build them someday. Some people like collecting models, it, yeah. it, uh, like stamps, die cast, die cast stuff. Yeah, you know, um, Corgi. Remember when we were down at Airfix and we were talking about collectibles? Yeah. You know, um, the manufacturers of these things are not stupid. They make things that are collectible um, mm. for, you know, that particular time, particular television series or whatever is coming out, and you're just buying it to own it. Yeah. Which is obviously what you buy things for, is you own them. But it's literally just that, isn't it? You're just collecting it yeah. to put it next to the other one that you've got yeah. or similar one. There was a picture of someone that collected um, Corgi or Dinky toy- Toys, and had a, had a lovely display cabinet full of them. Um, unfortunately, the five-year-old son that he had decided he wanted to play with them. So he came home one day to discover them all unwrapped and um, lined up on the floor where he'd been playing with them. So, yeah, put a lock on on, on, your, on your display cabinet. Talked about this before. I had, I had a family friend that had a lot of the Walker's Crisps fans all lined up yeah, on, yeah. on the shelf. That was torturous. Absolutely <laughs> torturous. My my mum collected Beanie Babies 15, 20 years ago. In the house, they have a dining room. Every single part of the wall is covered in Beanie Babies mm-hmm. in boxes. Yeah. You go in there and you feel like you've been stared out from every single angle, because you literally <laughs> are being stared at. And there's some rare ones in there that were quite expensive when they came out because the company knew that people would pay for sort of high prices. What they're worth now, I don't know. I imagine nothing. Well, no, if they're, if they're rare, they're, they're probably worth something. Yeah, but um, it's not like people are talking about Beanie Babies all the time. Or... They're in the box. This, this, that's the key. If the box is sealed, leave it sealed. If, you know, if you're collecting them, leave it sealed. Don't touch it. Oh, yeah, yeah. they're all in the boxes. They're, they're, they all got their tags. They've got tag protectors on them to stop the tag. Yeah. Wow. Bending or being affected by the environment. <laughs> I mean, they look very pretty. They're great wallpaper. <laughs> Let's see, see who they get left to in the world for the me and my sister get it. You'll fight over Beanie Babies. So in your stash. Yes. Now, there's a reason I'm asking this question, but your stash is in the garage, um, and you said you've got a, an overflow stash. Mm-hmm. Would you say that relatively regularly – move things around within uh, your garage stroke overflow? So do you swap things out? Your overflow is your overflow. I don't, know. The original idea was that the, my space in the garage, that was what we're going to have where my kids were. Um, and that has grown and grown. <laughs> and now they're on top of that cupboard. And now they're inside the other cupboard. Mm-hmm. And now they're in, indoors as well. So no, I don't rotate them at all, no. In fact, the last time I'd gone through my stash was quite a while ago. So it was nice going out there and have a look and see what I've got. Why do you, why do you ask? I, I ask because in the room I'm in, I have probably moved stuff around um, maybe as often as every six months, mainly because I've bought more um, and haven't got anywhere to store them in, in, in this hobby room. Move them around as in to keep them tip-top condition or just to reorganize them do you mean 
It's about what's float, floating my boat at this particular moment. Uh, I, I bought a, a B, B25. A uh, lovely kit. It was it was on my shelf in here for probably well over a year. And then I manoeuvred things around the beginning of this year and thought, no, no, I don't want it in here anymore. It's got to go upstairs in the stash. Right. Because my plans of what I wanted to build have changed. I've I've had another brainwave and or whatever. So yeah, I do I do move them around. I don't often relocate from the main stash into the hobby room unless there's a specific project in which I I've, I've gone, no, I really want to do that. Okay. So it's a quite a one way system, is it? Yeah, it's uh, it can be. Mm. And the downside to that, and this is part of the reason why I was saying I really need to to think about hundred percent what I want to build. Because the downside to that is there are things in which I have bought and gone, oh, that's a cracking idea. I could do this. I could do that, blah, blah. And then I've I've fallen out of love with that idea. And the, the model's been moved into the, the main stash. Yeah. And other things have come along which have a higher priority. And I've resisted going, oh, I don't want that kit anymore. I can get rid of it. I'll put it upstairs for safekeeping and I'll come back to that. And I've realized that potentially... Like I said, there there's certainly some kits in which I could swap out, and um, other things in which I want, or or, or there's just things in which I'm not going to do. Like for example, the one seventy second kits. Generally, there's although there's a couple of subjects that are quite interesting, I, I'm probably not going to do them. I think that's it, isn't it? Though because we change, like you said, I do too. I, I I go from one thing to another. You know, like I insert something that goes from one thing to another a lot. <laughs> just like that so for me to kind of say oh yeah i'm definitely not going to need that anymore and I'm, off i go and sell it makes me think well hang on now i'm probably going to switch my mind around again and then go oh i wish i didn't sell it and i'll go and buy it it just feels so strange kind of kind of pointless selling them because you can get them back and obviously you can pretty much buy any kit that you want you can pretty much go out and buy anything you want from ebay or amazon and everything else you know secondhand traders they're not something that's going to go out of production. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And let that then store them for you. <laughs> you no, know, Tamir is a good example. Some of the kits are seventies, and they're still coming out in the shop in brand new boxes. Do I do I need to buy that kit? And that's sort of the the thing in which I'm in my head and thinking is that I've bought that kit because I really like it. But the reality is, I could still probably buy it in twenty years' time, new. Yeah, and it's still knocking about. Yeah, or say that. Yeah, it's all right. And my biggest fear is something drastic happened to my home and I lost them through flood, fire, or whatever. That would be horrific, totally horrific for me. Uh-huh. You'd be getting back, though, wouldn't it? Yeah, that's it. And and also, I was thinking, actually, while I was writing the intro to this episode, going to your stash and being inspired. Maybe it's a, something that's happened to us in our journey, in our shopping habits, etc., but... Didn't you used to be inspired in model shops? Oh, I still am. Model shows, too. Well, I am as well. So, again, do I need a stash? Because the reality is I spend more time looking in model shop at model shows at model kits than I do looking at my own stash. Nobody needs a stash, do they? You don't need one. No. No, but it's nice to have one. Well, well, well they did. I, no, I, do you think people buy stuff just to build their stash up or do you think it's just a uh, uh, it just happens i think majority of the time i think it just happens i'm thinking of at least half a dozen people i know who have got reasonably large stashes and they're stuffed away in all sorts of nooks and crannies and one particular person i can think of was a guy i work with he had model kits in his home that he squirreled away but didn't really look at and didn't do an awful lot of model making when I took him to Telford, he, his um, passion was reignited, to which he, he then started looking in the nooks and crannies and went, oh, do you know, I didn't know I got that. <laughs> and that's that's partly how the group build started, was the fact that I was like, oh, I want to do this group build. And it's like, oh, I don't know. I don't know if I've got anything that will fit into that. So he'd go off and have a look in his squirrel holes. Yeah. And go, do you know what? I've got three kits in which I could do. <laughs> that's why group builds are so good, aren't they? Because there's always you can find something that you've got that will fit but then does that kind of throw you off your plan or what you want to build with your stashes well, i guess it doesn't matter does it you know uh, well I'm always i think th- I've, alluded, I've alluded to that you know the, 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 i can think of at least 
the last three years, at least a couple of times, where I've made a plan for the year. Yeah. And I've gone off and bought other bits and pieces and gone, well, no, I don't want to do that now. I'm going to do this. And certainly the what's coming to me this year, there are at least half a dozen projects in which I really want to do, which are going to knock back the other ones that I really want to do. Part of what I'm saying is that I want to um, focus a little bit more. Okay. I seem to be lost in my stash. Anyway, talking about stashes, what are your choices? Let's, let's, let's do that. Insert stash or cash jingle here. After this episode, we're not going to talk about it because I'm giving you a bit of time to interact with us and then we'll catch up with it after that. Yeah, so, right. Um, hmm. I have the Revel Saab AJ37 Vigan. Uh-huh. And uh, this is in 148 scale. I bought this for cheap. Uh-huh. Um, a chap had passed away um, who was a member of our local model club they had a lot of kits and the the club i was with were charged with selling them on making some money for his chosen charity they were all brought into the club uh people were looking through them and choosing the things and uh-huh. deciding what they wanted to build and all that kind of thing i didn't have any cash on me at the time um the one of the things that was left uh, yeah. was this figure and i thought oh yeah actually wouldn't it be nice if I did build one? Because they're quite they're quite cool looking, and there's delta wing things, awesome, really iconic. So I said to the guy who's who's kind of running the sale, I said, I'll, I'll, so I'll put some money in for that for that vegan. I didn't buy it for much. And then he said that kit is all raised panel lines, and so that's exactly when I found out it was all raised panel lines. Oh, <laughs> right. So pulling the pulling the kit out now. Um, this is the, one of the reasons I haven't touched it. I'll show you. All the panel lines across here are all raised up. It's like Braille. Now, I've never built a, a model kit that had raised panel lines, so I don't know what it's like. Um, but I don't hear good things. So I haven't touched it. I haven't put it together. It comes with a couple of resiny bits. It comes with a couple of uh, uh, conversion for the canopy. But... Yeah, I, I'm not sure whether I'm going to build it. I'm not sure whether I have the interest in building it. Um, so that is my first one that I submit up to stash or cash. Mm. Now, it's, it's interesting you say about raised panel lines because I did a comparison, uh, like I said earlier, about the B17 yeah. monogram kit uh, and the um, Hong Kong mm-hmm. models version. Um, and I made a big deal about the fact that there was raised panel lines. I didn't poo-poo it, um, but I did say, you know, raised panel lines is not what us modern mod- modern modelers uh, appreciate, la 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 la. la, la. Um, and I'll, I'll be honest, I can't remember the name of the person, um, but I had a very, uh, and bear in mind, I did that comparison some time ago now, so several years ago, and I it still gets views and still gets comments. Okay. Uh, six months ago, I got a comment from a gentleman who said, um, I don't understand why everyone bangs on about raised panel lines. Mm. The whole purpose of raised, raised panel lines was to make sure you had the line of which a skilled modeler <laughs> can sign back yeah. to get the correct line because you don't have grooves on aircraft. Right. I was completely ignorant of this fact. Um, and I, I actually... Um, this is strange, but the monogram kit was something in which I bought specifically to, to do the comparison, and then my idea was to sell it on. I wasn't going to keep it. Mm-hmm. However, I feel obliged almost to build both as a comparison, but build both yes. and do sand back the panel lines to, to make them right. Hmm. Okay. And it was, it was designed that way on purpose. Huh. This is what I was told. Whether this is a factual, accurate moment, I don't know, but I, I'll take it as read and I'll take it as true. So my question to you, before passing judgment, if you like, is that have you lost interest in the plane or is it the fact of the raised panel lines? It's the fact that it's got raised panel lines. Hmm. That's the issue. And that's why I haven't touched it. Now, I, I hear what you're saying about, you know, you sand them back. 
but I just took a photograph of it for the, the listeners. And the, the bottom of it is, if you know the vegan, there's like 12 round panels underneath. And rescribing that or sanding it back to even a, a smooth finish would be a task to make it look as, you know, yeah, all sanded back exactly the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To, to have an even... It would be better to leave them and then just dry brush so that they look like shadows rather than... Mm. something that they're just raised so maybe i should have a go at it because of that you know because i haven't done one and if i build one then i can then i can say yeah i should have sold it <laughs> i'm gonna go with i'm gonna go with a cash it right. because hearing what you're saying so i my advice would be cash it or swap it hmm Mm. Cash it or swap it. All right, I will take your advice and I will do just that. So it will go. What should I do? Should I put it on eBay or? Well, how will I cash it, dear Liza? There are lots of different ways. eBay is an option. Um, of course, is Facebook groups. Uh, there are Facebook groups in there which are literally buy or sell or swap. There's numerous ones out there. I will do that. I will eBay it and I'll let you know why. That was that was good actually because now I can go. Well, uh, James told me to. Get rid of that. That's yes, cool. James's fault. Well, let us know what you would have done. If you if you want to keep it, then go and buy it. <laughs> It'll be on eBay shortly. <laughs> That's right, yeah. Put the link in the chat for you. <laughs> so the first one I've picked up is this, and I'm showing it on the camera to, to Malcolm. So this is mm -hmm. the Airfix Club Limited Edition 172nd North American F86F Sabre mm -hmm. uh, with a MiG-15. Okay, yeah. So two kits in there, as it suggests, it is a limited edition. You open the box up, and it has the Airfix kits all in their bags, yeah. instructions, etc. Everything's there. The reason I got this was because I liked the box art. Oh. It's as simple as that. The thought of having a MiG and a Sabre together, for obvious reasons, yeah, just maybe go, oh, I like that. I'll have that. And it's a limited edition, remember. It's a limited edition. So did it come out with the club or did, was it? Is it a purchase that you brought that was somebody had, was in the club and then sold it and you bought it or did you buy it because you remember the club or the Airfix Club? Or? So I, I joined Airfix Club and I didn't buy this. This was actually something that was given to me um, because someone said they wouldn't build it. Oh, it was a gift? um yes does the does the person who gifted this to you listen to this podcast yes they do shit this is something in which i have been faltering over for some time and the main reason is the scale yeah uh one seventy second i if it was 148 i think it would stay in the stash and i would be more than happy to do it at some stage yeah because I have, I have ideas for it and yes they would be fighting each other and blah blah, blah but 170 second eh. mm. well there's two of them so you can double that 170 second up and probably be the size of a 130 second kit i could glue them together and make them a cyber mig but it's not um it doesn't float my boat anymore unfortunately mm. okay well um i can give you my opinion go on so you said that you you liked it because of the box art. Yeah. Is it because? Uh, but you didn't buy it. Basically, I did a swap. I think. From... Oh, I see. Personally, I, I think that box art is abhorrent. Oh. <laughs> I I loathe that scheme that is on the Mig. Oh. Loathe. Like I don't even want to look at it. The the sabers, the standard sort of saber, no problem with that. But I find the camo on that offensive on that. Uh... Mig. <laughs> because it's just ugh. so just because of that i would say to cash it get rid of it was it the big colors that, that that turns you on when you saw that kit or was it was it the saber i just quite like how they look huh. i've not done any research on mig so i have no idea about the camo i think if i did build it i probably would look to see what options there were are there options in the kit uh, no, that, this is what it is. In the kit, mm. is what it is. But I am that sort of person anyway. I'm somebody that will buy a kit and go, I like that. It's a very nice picture, but I'm not doing it like that. No, I wouldn't do it like that in a million years. I do. I actually quite like it. It's a fairly simple camo, isn't it? Yeah, I'm assuming that's all hand-painted, though. There's no, there's no decal for that. Is there? No, there's no decals for that, no. It looks like a green zebra. Green background with lots of worms over it. 
Yeah, yeah. Toontown Worms. Or Straw. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Okay, no, I'm gonna I'm gonna put it in the cell side then. Let's get out of my sight. I feel relieved. I thought you were gonna dig your heels in and say, No, no, I love it now. I love it so much. <laughs> it's one of those you look at it, it's a little bit like Marmite, I can't lie. And like I say, if it was one forty eight, I probably would have dug my heels in, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Well there you go. Are you going to eBay that or are you going to face bay it? Or... Do you know what? I think what I might do is I might try and put it onto a swap site hmm. uh, and see if anyone's A, interested and B, what they're willing to, to swap with. My hmm. only fear is it is 172nd. So to try and get a 148 for a 172nd, I might have to put something with it, I reckon. Right. Um, which I'm happy to do. That's not a problem. Yeah, it will need some enticing. Actually, do you know what? I know somebody. I know somebody that loves one really second. They might be interested. Well, we'll see. Anyway, uh, my next offering is this kit here. This is the 148 USAF B25D Pacific Theatre from Academy. Okay. This is a relatively new kit. I can't remember off the top of my head when it came out, but I think I've had it for a couple of years, maybe. It's a lovely kit. There's nothing wrong with it at all. It's, it is a, a lovely kit. But I just think i may have fallen out of love with it it's a very big kit isn't it it's a 148 those those um uh, rudders are going to be quite high off the ground especially if you do it on you know on its wheels i'm just looking to see whether it's still sealed or not it's not i didn't think so no. but let's have let's have a little look, looky loo inside the the artwork the livery or the the decals it comes with looks really interesting with that parrot on the front yes yeah uh, and that's is one of the things that drew me to it to start with was the the nose art. Mm. It does look pretty cool. Mm. I've never seen that before. We look inside, and obviously it's all still in its packets, etc., etc. Oh, there, right at the bottom. It's a beast, isn't it? It, it is. Yeah, I mean that, that's the decals. Mm. The the parrot has uh, different options. <laughs> yeah, right. So um, it's not just what's on the cover. There are a couple of options there. I think there is uh, maybe through two, two or three. Okay. There is some masks in there as well for the canopies, and it, you know, it's it's a. Uh, how big? How big are the wings? Could you pull the wings out? I'm not just pulling them out; they're falling out. So yeah, they're the wings. They are the normal problem. My rule is too small. It's what it's how you measure it. That's that's what matters. Absolutely. So they're about eight inches in length on one side. On one side? <laughs> How long is it on the underside? <laughs> on, the, on the other side, the other side is about the same. The fuselage itself is, it, it is, is knocking on probably about 25, 26 centimetres, I guess. Yeah. So it is quite a big bird. And the, the, the panel lines are all perfect. The riveting's lovely. Mm. I, I can't, I, honestly, I can't say anything bad about the kit. The kit's lovely. Academy kit, good pedigree. And uh, I think the box art yep. looks quite fun, certainly. What's the aircraft called? It's not Mitchell, is it? Uh, this is a, a B-25. A B-25, would that be a Mitchell? See, yeah, I mean, it's, it looks pretty cool. Yeah. And it's the sort of thing that you were built. I'm surprised that you've put that up. <sighs> Yeah, I mean, overall, um, I'm just looking on the box because I never remember the box did actually say how big it was. Um, no, it doesn't actually say on the side of the box. Yeah, it's 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 a funky aircraft. It is. It, it looks funky. It looks lush. Yeah. And I've seen them built up, and they do look really good built, built up, I think. I haven't heard any bad reports about the kit. Well, put it out to tender, shall we? Find out. Um, if it was me... Yeah. I think you should keep that. I think you should put it back in the stash where it was and don't disturb it because I think it's your scale. Mm-hmm. It's your era. Mm-hmm. It's a, it's an airplane. And you like area planes, don't you? I do like area planes. It's it's a parity and you don't have a parrot, but um, no. it is very interesting. It's kind of like Angry Birds or something, isn't it, on the front there? Yeah, it is, yeah. Mm, you should keep it. It's on that pile in, in my mind as I can get this any time. I don't have to keep this. Hmm. That's sort of my thinking on it. How cool would it be if you did like a, a treetop diorama that is exactly like the box art here? So you do the base is just a load of treetops and you just have it just flying over the top of the treetops. Really, really good. But you know what I would do, Malcolm, is I would build the whole tree 
I wouldn't just do the tops. I wouldn't be able to do that. It would be a diorama of trees with a plane on top. Because <laughs> I don't do yeah. simple. Do you know, I, airplanes are a funny thing with me. I um, I do like to look at airplanes that are static. Uh, and we had this conversation before in, a, in other, yeah. uh, another podcast. Flying is always something that's a bit, I find a bit weird. I have done a Spitfire that's flying into a picture. Yeah. Um and I I got the funky extras for the the propellers so it, it it's you haven't got the ring of round plastic with the the painting effect you've got like a physical bit of PE mm-hmm. your propeller moving the idea of yep. movement and I really like that. Okay. And and the only other one that I've not had static per se uh, was a Huey hanging in a tree but um <laughs> it's still static. I yeah, I don't know. Keep it. That's what I'm saying. Okay, well, I'm gonna put I'm gonna put it in the keep it file then. Well, yeah, find out what the people say. Yeah, find yeah. Out what let's, people let's see say. your votes. I'm, I'm I will put the poll up. Um, yeah, put a picture up. Uh, see what people say, and then do what the people say. Yeah. Okay. All right. My next one is reach right over, and let me send you an image on Messenger so that you can look at it while we talk. Cool. Oh, there it is. Just arrived. So it comes with a picture. <laughs> <laughs> and a little story. I went to Duxford Air Museum in the UK. And yes. And in there, they have uh, lots of airplanes and things like that. But they also have a place where they are restoring the aircraft. Um, mm-hmm. I can't remember off the top of my head now what that hangar is called. Is it the Duxford Restoration Restoration company? hangar. Restoration company or something? Oh. Something company. I'm sure it is. I don't know. We should look it up. But, I know. I know it has changed actually. Ah, okay. So, mm. in there, um, they have what I've shown you the picture that is from Duxford. They have a fairy firefly, the Mark One, and it is painted yellow or orange, or, uh, like a training color yellow. Mm-hmm. Now, this particular aircraft was used in Sweden, and it was uh, I don't know uh, went wrong or it broke or they, or something or they just didn't want to fly it anymore and it became a target for quite a while um, sat out in the uh, in the rain uh, and it was just a target to shoot at and that's why it was painted bright yellow me being a lover of textures and colors and things when you go up really really close to this thing there are four or five different shades of orange and yellow that they've used to paint Mm-hmm. different different sh- levels of paint are coming off at different times um it's a dirty unlooked after oil covered <laughs> orange aircraft with no wings because the wings have been removed they do have the wings in the hangar um and that took my imagination i thought i could paint that mm. that would look really cool it's just as it is now got me thinking that maybe i should build my own so I went out and I, I looked for quite a while trying to find my own uh, fairy firefly uh, in a Mark I, which I finally found. Um, and I think I found it. I was at the Abingdon model show and they had a fairy firefly. And I remember thinking, I don't have the money for that, but I'm buying it anyway. Um, and uh, I did. So I've got it. It's one, one, It's in a 148 scale. Yep. yep. So it's a reasonably good size. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. It, it has quite a long fuselage because, uh, as you can see, it's got that kind of extra section for the co-pilot to sit in. Don't know why he's there. He doesn't seem to have any access to weapons. Maybe he's. A... I think he was a nav- navigator and radio operator, wasn't it? Oh, I see. Right. Possibly. Yeah, it does have a very uh, kind of very long antenna across the top. Yeah, maybe that's what it was. I don't know much about the airplane. All I know about is that it looks really cool in orange. Mm. <laughs> so that was my plan back in 20, 2017. So so quite a few years ago, five years ago, and I still haven't built it. I still haven't done it. I still, uh, uh, But I love the picture. Just, br- just bringing it up again, just to show you, reminded me of how much I really like it. I really like the, the idea of making something really, really weathered in that color. Mm. Now, if you if you search the internet for other uh, pictures, you'll probably find ones that are you know closer. And you'll be able to see the uh, different um, textures and things like mm. that. In fact, I'll probably just do that now. So, what what was the actual kit that you got? Sorry, yes, this is a special hobby, one forty eight, uh, oh. Fairy Firefly Mark One. Mm-hmm. 
So they're restoring it currently. Uh, I, I just wanted to build it as it as it looked in this kind of yellowy orange, mucky kind of way. I thought it was quite interesting because like the whole rudder is kind of almost destroyed. There's bullet holes in it. There's weathering opportunities. <laughs> so much going on in that picture. Well, let me show you another one. It's even closer. So not only is the yellow interesting the silver sorry the the natural metal finish parts yeah. that they've got on there those are also got different colors and yellows and stuff on them too and let me show you that picture as well you see they've got like covers on the exhaust they've got like a big tarpaulin over the top it's just a mess <laughs> yeah you can see in that picture i just sent you lots of different shades of yellow on different panels yeah there's a bit of chipping here and there, but the chipping is yellow. There's a couple of bullet holes in it. Yeah, even the damage to the propeller as well. Oh, is there? Yeah. Oh, yes, there is. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, so now there'll be a bit of work to do because obviously I'll have to remove the, the rudder parts, uh, squash down the, the, the back a bit because it's a bit buckled <laughs> where the, uh, the the rear wheel is. I'll have to scratch bill where the uh, wings have been removed and add that to the yeah. kit. But, uh, yeah, what do you think? I'll leave it. Well, I know for a fact that the listeners are going to look at that picture and go, no, keep it. It's got, you've got to do that. That's got your name written all over it, definitely. Special Hobbies, funnily enough, I've actually got a similar kit of the same aircraft. Oh, well, the Firefly. They can be a bit tricky, the, those particular kits, uh, I'm told. Mm-hmm. Never built one myself, but 100%, you have got to keep that. I want to see you do the uh, the tarpaulin on the on the cockpit. I want to see you do the discoloration because I know you can really do that. You do an amazing job on that. But more so, I want to see how you get that effect on the exhaust because <laughs> it it looks like someone's been throwing toilet paper at it. It looks like it's wrapped with toilet paper and badly, isn't it? I don't know. Is it like PTFE tape or something? I don't know what that is. Uh, I don't know. Either that or it's icicles. <laughs> I've been trying out their icicle methods on a real plane. I don't know. I don't know. So you, you, you must build that. You must. And also, the, the other thing in which not only, I think, with that particular choice would really be down your street, so to speak, but... There's a little bit of extra detail in which you've got to throw at it mm. uh, to achieve that's not within the kit, which I think you'd really enjoy doing. So the ends of the wings and, and the broken tail. I, 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 yeah, they're, they're sort of things in which I, I think you would thrive on. Mm. So that's a that's a definite keeper from me. Okay. Put it out to the, the folks, eh? That's going to take some photographs of it while we're talking about it. Cool. All right. I uh, will keep it for now, see what they say. My only worry is, is whether you've got sufficient paint <laughs> because the colours are just enormously varied. What I probably would do is base colour it in yellow and then just use lots of different oranges and yeah, light reds and sort of flesh, fleshy yellows, elf yellows, to sort of bring it out. Just washes, isn't it, really? Just mm. layer upon layer of different washes. Yeah. Oh, I can see two, at least two different types of yellow on there. Oh, there's four. Four, yeah, maybe. And a lot of the writing on the side, the decals and stuff were worn down, so yeah. All right, I'll put it in there. I'll put it back. Definitely. So your last choice. Yes. My all seem to have a, a theme. Like, I bought this with good intention. Uh-huh. Right, so I need to send you these pictures uh-huh. so that you can understand why this particular kit was purchased in the first place. It's going to be three pictures. So these are photographs of an an abandoned MiG-21. <laughs> the pictures I have of it are in, in different stages of abandonment. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's basically an abandoned MiG that was found in Belgium, someone's back garden. I think it's on YouTube, actually. Some guys have videoed it, gone, walked all over it, and sat in the cockpit and took video of it. And it was just... Mm-hmm. Completely fucked. <laughs> it's no way this is going to ever fly again. But yeah, I, I thought it was an interesting looking subject um, because it had so much weathering potential. Mm-hmm. So, not to go uh, by halves, I went out and purchased a 132nd scale MiG 21 by Ravel. Now, it's a big kit, <laughs> it's a beast. It's an absolute beast. And it's an old kit too. The paper's yellow. 
you know it smells like it's it's been dug up you know a billion years ago yeah and it's got raised panel lines funnily enough but the idea was that i was going to build the kit up not brilliantly because it's going to be abandoned and just go to town with the weather yep. like from tip to toe and maybe not even follow the photographs exactly because it goes through stages of abandonment you know there's different rust patterns and things depending on what year it was photographed and yeah. and that kind of thing and the kit you know seems to be reasonable i haven't made any attempt at putting any of it together but I, i've kind of kept that back the decals are nice they're still in good nick but if i show you the size of the, the cockpit that'll give you an idea how big this thing will be it's, it's a long aircraft right so oh, wow. that is without the tail. Oops. That's without the tail and without the, the pointy nose cone bit. So it's going to be going to be big. Yeah, yeah. And obviously I wanted to you know, do all the streaks and all the weathering and all the rust and everything else. And I have a feeling that you're going to say the same thing as you did about the Firefly. The, the problem with this is, is that you applied three pictures. And I'll be honest, I'm looking at these pictures and I'm thinking to myself, oh, wow, three models, that's got to be amazing. So I'm semi-disappointed that you, you, you just want to do one. However, with that said... Three pictures of the same item. And, and how you delivered the pictures to me told me the story as to what you thought. Because I'll, I'll try and describe the picture. So the first picture is um, of this aircraft looking very uh, mossy, um, dirty, grimy, uh, surrounded by trees and uh, young trees, to be honest. Almost, I would say, an autumn sort of scene, maybe, and, and looking very very sad, if I'm honest. Uh, the second picture is obviously during the summer because everything's very green. There's suddenly lots of ferns everywhere, and it's still looking grubby. Uh, it's got a tree that's in full bloom that's that's hanging on the... Yeah. Or sitting on top of the, the cockpit there and uh, the nose is attached and that's that's an awesome diorama just there right there but then you held back the last picture and i totally understand why you did it um because this is really more of what you want to do so this this aircraft is now in full decay so there's bits missing uh panels are missing the nose cones missing and gone <laughs> Uh, the cockpit is now open, uh, and yeah, and, and disappeared. The big long pointy thing is gone. It's graffitied, and it's you all over. Sorry, yeah, it, this is something definitely you got to do. The race panel lines. I think actually, to, now I'm gonna I'm gonna really throw the cat amongst the pigeons. I would tell you now to get rid of the Vigan. Don't worry about the race panel lines scenario that I was thinking in my head at the time. Get rid of that. Keep this and explore the joy of sanding down your panel lines. Because let's face it, if you lose a little bit of detail in your sanding and it's not quite even all over, it's not going to matter in, in, in this particular picture. I wouldn't bother painting underneath, would I? To be honest, it's in true fashion of, of not painting underneath because you could just put loads of ferns and stuff underneath it. So, <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, it's a lot of work. Yeah, it is. But again, in the whole story of the thing, the, the, the missing panel lines, etc., that'd be a bit of scratch building you'd have to do and a little bit more research. And I think, to be honest, I think you'd get as much kick out of doing that as you would out of your saloon that you did. Mm. Yeah, I did enjoy doing that. Yeah, 100%. That's a 100% keeper. 100%. Okay. It also comes with a an engine as well inside. So I could leave the engine in and have that still being shown. But I imagine the engine's been taken out. I have to go and see what... Yeah, possibly. But, uh, but at the end of the day, you know, you've got three great reference pictures there of which you can take bits out of each of those pictures to a point uh, and just explore it. And leaving the engine in, actually would be pretty fantastic. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. I mean, you can even see the typical MIG cockpit colour still is yeah. in there. God knows what the inside of that cockpit is like now with all the water and wind and yeah. trees and everything else that's been in there and possibly used as a, a nest <laughs> by some sort of raccoon or crow. If you ever wanted to know where bears take a dump in the woods... <laughs> Okay, I'll keep hold of it then. I'm going to have to nag you to get that done. 
So I think, to be honest, we may have started a bit of a theme because the next one, I think I already know what you're going to say to me. This box is huge. It's a 135th kit. It is from Hobby Boss. The length of it is 570 millimeters. The width is 94. <sighs> and this is the kit. The Soviet MBV-2 gun. And this is a tank on rails, basically. Where did you get that from? This was a whim purchase, 100%. I saw it, loved it, thought I want it, and uh, I did. It comes with PE. Uh, it's not a great deal, but there is a little bit of PE in there. Mm -hmm. It builds up. I'm sure I'm busy tearing the box here. I will take pictures of all of this. On the back there, it's um, it explains what the some CAD drawings of, of what's uh, the the guns look like, etc. That does look very otherworldly. It looks weird, right? Really, really weird. Mm. So this is the profile. Yeah. The front. Mm -hmm. The profile of the back, like super weird. Yeah. Uh, so uh, have you seen the film or read the book with Snowpiercer? Yes, I have. Kind of reminds me of that kind of. It sort of does, right? I have a German BR fifty two locomotive mm. at one thirty fifth. You know, I had a train moment. Basically, I become a, a bit of a spotter. I, I thought the two could go well in our diorama somehow. This is another purchase I made. It wasn't an awful lot of money, if I'm honest, from what I remember. So it was a good deal. It was bought brand new. It's it's been open to have a look at the plastic. There are no decals with it at all because it's painted basically white. Weird looking thing. Does it come with figures? Um, no. It comes with track. Okay. Does um why what <laughs> why does it have an open window at the front? So on the box, yeah, really bizarrely, it's an open window. And what it is is you can just peer inside and see the plastic of the train, ten centimeters from one end. But it basically gave you a section of the train that you could look at to see what it would look like. Does it have interior? No, there's no interior. It has three main guns, and then it has machine gun posts and a funky, I seem to remember, this device here, which looks like four machine guns, <laughs> which I, I assume would be to take out any aircraft or a defense against aircraft. Take anything out, wouldn't it? <laughs> that thing, but it's inside the tank, so mm. it, it seems really weird. So, I, whether it pops up, <laughs> I don't know. Well, it must do. Look, yeah, look at the picture on the right hand side, look, it comes up and is, is then operated by somebody. Yeah, um, odd though. Hide it and then bring it out when they need it. I, I bought it down from the loft specifically when we record this episode, and I very confidently bought it out of the loft. The more I handle it, the more I'm like. Mm. I don't know. Hmm. The, the the potential for weathering is high, but I wager there's not much detail on this. I think it's just big old massive panels. Uh, what I'll do is I will take out of the box the what you're what you're peering at through the oh, through the little window. And that, that that would do it for me. So if it's got lots of detail. So panels and rivets and bits and bobs on the on the on the walls of this tank train, then I would say keep it and explore that. It's huge. It is huge. Yeah, it is still in its wrapper. I've not opened it, but basically it's very flat. They they are big panels. They are very raised panels actually, which would be about right because they would be welded steel plates. Mm, yeah, yeah. So that's fine. Um, there is a couple of doors. But very, and a couple of portholes. Uh, mm. That's it. It's it, it is. And I'll be honest. When I got it out of the box and I looked at it, I list, these are the bits I looked at. So the two bits you get is the top half and the underneath, which is the bit you don't paint. Yeah, of course. I pulled it out and looked at it, and I was very uninspired by it. It looks like it looks like a Lancaster or something, doesn't it? It looks like the <laughs> fuselage of a Lancaster. Do you know what? The fuselage of a Lancaster is probably not far off. The same length, mm. if I'm honest. I I would say um, sell it. Cash that in for a, a few pennies and buy something you really, really want. 
Uh, I don't see... I couldn't imagine that being something I would enjoy looking at on a on a model show table. It is just a slab of metal, isn't it? This thing yeah. hasn't got any kind of nice lines on it. It hasn't got any prettiness to it whatsoever. The only other thing is, it, it, does it have any particular history? Does it actually exist? It's a it's something that did exist. This <laughs> this box here that I'm now showing you, okay, mm. that's part A. Oh, that's why the box is so big. So why is okay? So what's all this stuff then? So this is all the all the guns. Uh, you've got the the track. You've got a bat, like a diorama base. Well, so all the turrets are quite well detailed then. So the turrets are quite well detailed. You've got bogies, obviously. Um, yeah, you need to wipe your nose, and and they look quite detailed in themselves. But the, but the <laughs> so looking at that picture, you can't see the wheels. They're all covered up. No, you can't. Uh, it's a train too, so get rid of it. <laughs> Simple. This is box B. Oh, gosh. box B. You're gonna take pictures of all this stuff. Yeah, I, I knew I should have opened it. Silly me. Do you know there might be someone listening going, "Oh, Soviet MBV. I've always wanted to build one of those." This is the turrets, and the turrets are fairly well detailed. Mm. Uh, but even the turrets are—they're basic Russian turrets. I don't know. I can't see it being your thing. It's not a BR-52, without a doubt. For those that don't know, a very large German loco. Detail on that from Trumpeter. Phenomenal. There's a lot of work in that kit. Yeah, there's no there's no gantry on this at all. There's no... No, but it does scream out an awful lot for a diorama. Does it, though? No. What would you What would you do? Well, this is a diorama that you would need to to add figures to and it would be a resupply diorama all day long okay so yeah boxes of ammo crates and, and, and yeah stuff i mean like you that. could go quite crazy with it you wouldn't really want to do it on the base they've provided and go yeah i've done it i guess you've got a lot of fun a bit like a massive blank canvas to just do all the weathering and chipping you want now i'm going to say i'm definitely going to say cash it in Give it to someone that is going to want to build that and has wanted to build one of those for a long, long time, knows all about them, <laughs> and go and focus on your craft that you're keeping. Yeah, I've, I've got to find a train spot. I mean, what? Do they? Is that? Are you sure that's a real thing? Because it just seems so ridiculously big. Yeah. What? Yeah, no, it is. There you go. That's my, that's my thing. Put it out to the... Uh... Yeah, let us know what you think of that one. With the choices I made, I purposely made ones that were different, so there's not really a theme to it, which is a little bit like my stash, to be honest, in, in many ways. But, uh, yeah, there you go. I found this whole process very, very interesting. It is, right? I'm glad we did it. Yeah, I'm looking forward to doing that again. So if you're listening and uh, you have something in your stash that you are not sure whether you should keep it or get rid of it, uh, so stash or cash... Pop it in, send us a picture of it, and let's see what people think. And if it's interesting enough, we might discuss it on the show. Is that right, James? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I think if you have similar stories like Malcolm has displayed with his choices, then they add that to it because then we you, we might understand the rationale of you buying it. I don't have research for every single kit; it's just those particular ones I have. Uh, no, and absolutely, and and you know, don't get me wrong. Probably eighty percent of the kids I've bought, I've done a little bit of research on. I might have saved a picture here or there, mm -hmm. but there are selected items where I want to go a bit crazy that I've gone crazy on the the reference material. Cool, that was brilliant. Well, I'm gonna put that one kit, the the vegan. I'm gonna put that on eBay. See what happens. Yes, definitely. All right. I'll wait to see what the guys, certainly with the uh, the Hobby Boss kit, the tank on rails. Tank train. The trank. <laughs> the trank. Um, I'll wait to see what people say. But the uh, FX Club, definitely, that's gone. Stashes give you the ability to be inspired by looking through your kits. It's almost like a badge of honour as to allow your friend to admire your choices. As long as they don't touch them. Or maybe it's really closer to a collection for you, like people collect stamps. Model kicks don't lose value if stored well and sometimes even bring you a profit. But also, with a little bit of clever moving around, you can swap them
for those kits you really need. Next time, we'll be just making conversation about scratch building. You have been listening to Just Making Conversation with James Giffins and Malcolm Childs. Follow us on Facebook where we post photos, updates and other nonsense. Find us on Spotify, Amazon Music, iTunes, Google Podcasts and all of the others. Let us know what you are just making and what your thoughts are on the conversation in this episode. Thank you to the following supporters from buymeacoffee.com forward slash JMC podcast. Tim, Black Rifle, John, Julian, Chuck, Mark, Bakawi, Simon, the Jersey Gent, Steve, Lee, Costa, Mark, Ray, Neil, Mike, Robert, Andrew, Drew, John, Mike, Jeff, Richard, Lynn, Gordon, and not forgetting six others. If you do show your support, leave your name so we can give you a shout out. Bye. Goodbye. Just before we do that, I just wanted to say that I had replied uh, to the IPMS Hamilton um, about the Musaru 4. Wait, wait a minute. A Musaru update? Well, it kind of is. Okay. It's a new Musaru. It's, I haven't, I'm not writing another jingle just, just for this. I say write like I wrote to the last one. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, just to let you know, I had replied to that email, and I have put myself down for Moose Roof 4. Woohoo! It's going to be fun. I hope it's... Hey, build something inside a pistachio nut. <laughs> I'll be like, yes, I have the tools. I haven't challenged IPS Hamilton to this build, have I? I don't know. No, I haven't. Well, there you go. It's there. IPS Hamilton, I know you're listening. The whole club has to get their nuts out and play with them. I think you might have to directly invite them rather than just assume that the club lists. <laughs> I am uh, composing the notes of the Musuru Wrangler as we speak. <laughs> Dear Musuru Wrangler. I would like to know whether you have a nut rustler. <laughs> <laughs> it's the joke that just keeps on giving. Oh, yes. <laughs>